Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, here uh, for uh, this event with uh, colleagues, friends, alumni. Uh, I look out and see uh, faces, uh, all of whom, or nearly all of whom, are familiar, and some who I haven't seen for uh, a little while. So it's absolutely terrific to have you here. I'm Bob Blum, and I'm a professor and chair of this uh, extraordinarily wonderful department. As uh, we uh, thought about uh, putting together uh, the program for today, what um, we uh, strive to do is to build on the momentum uh, that was generated from uh, the uh, recent International Conference on Family Planning that was held in Addis Ababa uh, just a few weeks ago, but also to share a bit beyond that some of the work that uh, is being done in this department that relates to sexual and reproductive health more broadly. And um, so uh, in... Um, Preparing for this, I sent out a note to faculty and said, what are you doing in sexual and reproductive health? And the list was astounding. Our reach as a department goes from Baltimore to Burkina Faso. It goes from laboratory-based work to community. It goes from maternal and men's health to early adolescence. It spans pretty much the entire age spectrum, certainly the reproductive age spectrum. Our agenda is global. And this um, uh, just highlights uh, the countries where there are one or more active programs or projects uh, that uh, are going on through population, family, and reproductive health. Just to give you some snapshots, we have currently, and these are all current faculty-led projects, five systematic reviews that are in process. Uh, there's a um, one supported through WHO on comprehensive adolescent health programs. One supported through MacArthur, exploring young people's sexual and reproductive health uh, assessment practices. There's a um, project, a systematic review being launched now through support from uh, UNFPA uh, actually, uh, it's uh, UNICEF, uh, Gender Socialization of Young Adolescents. There's a, um, another systematic review that Kristen Mari is leading on strategies to improve condom use, effective adolescent prevention programs, all different systematic reviews. There are a number of initiatives that we have that are analyzing extant data sets on the impact of teenage childbirth at schooling loss in 76 countries. Here, uh, Young Ting Boniface and uh, David Bashai are calculating the costs in years of school loss from teen pregnancy, factors associated with early childbirth using mix and DHS data that Michelle Decker and others are uh, leading. Uh, uh, covert use of uh, contraception in nine sub-Saharan African countries led by Stan Becker. Quality, quality of birth history of DHS that Stan is uh, also leading. Adolescent sexual and reproductive health secondary DHS analysis that Michelle and, and, and uh, Michelle are uh, doing together. Michelle squared. Other global uh, data analyses uh, pro uh, projects uh, looking at NSFG 
understanding adolescent sexual risk behaviors here in the United States, uh, work that Amy Choi and colleagues are doing in demographic dividend, exploring the relationships between health and human capital, and uh, a project that Michelle Decker is doing uh, looking at gendered risk, substance use, and HIV among urban uh, women. There'll be a quiz on all of this at the end. Uh, um, there are a number of multinational studies uh, that uh, are currently underway in the department. Uh, the uh, Family Health and Wealth Study, the well-being of adolescents of vulnerable environments that takes pl uh, place in five countries. Global Early Adolescence Study being launched in uh, six countries. And we'll hear about some of these uh, studies and projects this afternoon. There's uh, uh, the exciting uh, initiative that came from the London Summit on performance monitoring and accountability uh, that Scott Radloff and uh, an entire team uh, are uh, uh, leading. Advanced family planning that's in its second uh, phase now of its expanded support. And again, we'll hear about that from Beth Frederick. Uh, and uh, sexual and reproductive health needs of very young adolescents that uh, Court Robinson uh, and colleagues are leading. And this is taking place in refugee camps at the uh, Thai-Burma border, at the Somalia uh, Ethiopia border and uh, at the Syrian Lebanese uh, border, looking at 10 to 14 year olds. We do a number of studies, some of which are basic science research that look at preterm birth risks. Uh, Xiaobin Wang uh, heads up uh, a laboratory looking at uh, uh, um, genomic factors associated with preterm births, looking at um, preconception nutrition and endocrine disruptors and their consequences for reproductive outcomes. Janet DiPietro is working in fetal neurobehavioral development and postnatal continuity. And uh, uh, Michelle Decker has a project in Russia looking at HIV prevention uh, for female commercial sex workers. The department does um, uh, numerous intervention and survey, uh, sorry, service delivery uh, studies. This just gives you a glimpse of some cost effectiveness of family planning services in Asud, comparing mobile clinics and stationary clinics, injectable contraception and in, uh, HIV, uh, uh, HSV. Uh, uh, incidents in young South African women, a new uh, uh, R01 NIH grant that Hina Brambat uh, is uh, heading up, prophylactic administration of oxytocin in postpartum women in four communities in Ghana, uh, uh, Cindy Stanton is heading, a, a, a violence prevention uh, program intervention and evaluation being done here, dating matters that Terry Williams is doing, and trafficking uh, at the Thai-Burma border that Court and Michelle Decker uh, are leading. Other kinds of uh, intervention uh, uh, projects. There's this uh, NIH-funded study uh, looking at the role of the black church in adolescent sexual and reproductive health. There's another NIH study looking at the role of the black church here in Baltimore in uh, HIV prevention among men who have sex with men. Arc Marcel heads up uh, Project Connect, which is aimed at improving sexual and reproductive health outcomes for Latino and African American men who have sex with men. Uh, Michelle Decker is developing a and piloting a gender-based violence uh, intervention module to reduce HIV risk among female commercial sex workers. And she's also working with a colleague in Pittsburgh, Elizabeth Miller, on a family planning clinic-based uh, intervention to reduce partner violence. Begin to see and hear some of the themes of 
uh, our work. So it's an extraordinary body of work. It is why central to this department of population, family, and reproductive health, that reproductive health is so very central. So I, together with you, look forward to uh, this afternoon. I look forward to uh, hearing some of the exciting work uh, that is being done uh, by uh, some of our colleagues. And uh, to facilitate uh, the panel, the discussions, and to serve as the absolute czar of time uh, is uh, Professor Emerita Laurie Zabin. There are few people uh, who truly need no introduction. I said to Laurie I would limit mine to only 45 minutes. Uh, is that enough? Not enough. So uh, uh, Laurie, uh, as uh, I think everyone here knows, is not only an academician, is not only a scholar, is not only a researcher. She is a passionate advocate and has been for so much of her life. She entered into academia the way few of us do, and that is from practice, from running uh, Planned Parenthood clinics here in uh, Baltimore and in Maryland, and going from there to uh, generating the questions that informed her academic career. So Laurie, let me turn the podium to you uh, and welcome you and all of you today to what should be a great afternoon. Well, I have the great privilege of having 45 minutes to introduce each of six speakers. Now, that should uh, take us a bit of time. Um, I am not going to take any time on my own because they all have so much of interest to tell you. Uh, each one will be speaking for about uh, 10 minutes, uh, and uh, then there will be time, I hope, for questions. Uh, I'm going to dive right in and introduce our first speaker uh, so as not to waste any of the very precious minutes that we have uh, for them to speak. Uh, our very first speaker uh, is Jose Ramon, who everybody knows as Oying, so from here on, that's it. Uh, he is the deputy director of our Bill and Melinda Gates Institute for Population and Reproductive Health and a senior scientist in our department. Now I'm going to say once, just to make it clear to anybody that hasn't been around enough uh, to hear the difference, that we do need to keep the Gates Institute and the Gates Foundation separate. Uh, many people think they uh, are sort of one and the same, but our Gates Institute is a recipient of the uh, of the beneficence of the foundation. Uh, and he is now uh, deputy director uh, of the institute here uh, in the department. Uh, he uh, uh, has a BA in journalism and a master's in communication, both from the University of the Philippines, a postgraduate diploma in population studies from the University of Wales in Cardiff, uh, he was a fellow at Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, and uh, he has, has more than 30 years of leadership uh, in uh, the field of public health. He designed and managed and evaluated countless advocacy and behavior change projects. He was a founding member uh, and senior deputy director of the Center for Communication Programs uh, here at Hopkins, uh, and I was also director of the Health Communication Partnership, a global health promotion program. Uh, prior to joining Hopkins, he was a senior officer, and here we're getting the distinction correct, uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, and he co-chaired the Foundation's Social and Behavioral Change Working Group. He was a core member 
uh, of the uh, of the uh, planning team for the London Summit on Population, which prepared him very, very adequately um, for uh, his role uh, in lead organizing uh, the recent conference that you've heard so much about uh, in Addis Ababa. And that's what he'll tell us about today. Oying? Thank you, uh, Lori. I thought it is uh, fitting to show a two and a half minute video that our own Spencer from the Office of External Relations prepared uh, just a few days ago um, of the Addis Conference. So let's start with that first. Oops. How do we play this? Welcome to this historic third international conference on family planning. All 3,300 of us coming from 120 countries. This conference and the issues it raises stand as a resounding call to use evidence and compassion to illuminate best practice. The first conference in family planning was four years ago. The fact that we have 3,000 attendees at this conference shows you, I think, the momentum that's happening in the family planning field, and that's really exciting to see. Family planning affects agriculture, affects development, affects population, it affects environment, it affects everything in the nation. So family planning is a thing that if you want to cause impact or cause change in a place, in the nation, it's a thing to start with. Ethiopia has demonstrated that with country ownership, sustained political commitment and effective strategies, there is hope for dramatically improving access to voluntary family planning services and reduce the unmet needs. The challenges like reproductive health care and family planning are bigger than the political boxes that some try to force them into. These are basic human necessities that hundreds of millions of women are forced to go without. Well, we have made some advances we have a very long way to go. It's the poor, it's the marginalized, it's the remote, uh, it's the most discriminated against who are suffering the greatest. And our policy is choices, not chance. This is about giving people choices. It is more than a health issue. It is a social, cultural, political, and economic issue. The momentum around family planning has been building up in various countries across the globe. For example, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Rwanda have shown a dramatic increase in contraceptive prevalence rate of modern methods among married women of reproductive age. Let's make sure that their courage counts. Let's fight with them for as hard as we can and for as long as it takes. Let's join hands to make the world a better place for women, children, and use. Let's go back to our conflicts. Let's go back to our missions. Let's make sure that women still get access to family planning. Let's make sure they stop dying of giving birth. Let's make sure girls stay in school. Let's make sure that they reach their full potential. Together, under this banner of FP 2020, we're revitalizing family planning. It is back on the global health agenda, right where it should be. And this goal that we've got to give 120 million women voluntary access by 2020, we're going to get there. Incredible, isn't it? Just uh, to provide context, uh, in 2009, the first ever family planning conference was held in Kampala, Uganda. It was in a place which was essentially pronatalist. And we were testing the idea, if we hold it in a pronatalist country, can we have actually an impact in policy change? And I think as many of you know, 
who have worked in Uganda, there has been policy change there. Two years later, in the car Senegal, we said we're going to bring the conference to this part of the world which is most in need of family planning, maternal health, neonatal child health care. And we brought it there and brought light to Francophone African country needs. As a result of those two conferences, the London Summit and Family Planning was convened. And in that conference, in that convening, donors raised $2.6 billion more of new money to provide 120 million more women and girls contraceptive access in the poorest countries of the world. That's only from the donors. It's very hard to count the counterpart money from the government itself. And then, of course, we brought the conference to Addis in order to celebrate, to, mo to maintain the momentum that we have achieved. Addis, where there was almost a 100% increase in modern contraceptive methods in just five years. So the theme of this conference was full access, full choice. And it was the largest ever family planning conference held so far. We had 12 members in our core donor group. We have 45 member organizations in the International Steering Committee. There was a very active National Steering Committee. And the latest numbers that we finally looked into it's about 3,420 attendees actually uh, coming from 110 countries. The others were just estimate. Uh, there were key uh, plenaries during the last, during the three days of the conference and you can read that on the right side. There were round tables hosted by CEOs. There was a high level ministerial meeting of ministers and Beth uh, Frederick will talk about that. But to me, the big lesson learned here uh, in running a huge convening like this is really the distributed model of funding and accountability. I don't think we could have hosted this conference and the funds and the talent alone of the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute in the Ministry of Health of Ethiopia. It is the distributed model of funding in which everybody pitched in a distributed model of accountability in which everybody has a role and a responsibility and everybody contributed to the success of the conference. So you may ask, why the hell are we in this business? This business of logistics, of convening, of conference? Well, it's easy to answer that question. We are in the business of generating science and evidence and translating the science and evidence into policies, programs, and practice. That's why we're involved in these types of convening. High quality sessions, um, almost all the feedback that we got in terms of the quality of the plenary as well as the 700 presentations in, one, in over 160 sessions in a period of about three days, not counting all the pre-events and all the side events that were happening at the same time, was from good to excellent. There's a quote here from Mike Mbezo, who used to be WHO's Director for Reproductive Health and Research, and also happens to co-chair with, with Amy, the scientific uh, committee which reviewed all the abstracts the research and the program abstracts. And let me quote him in an email sent to us. The level of interest in the conference has been exceptional. From the scientific exchanges, the networking, to addressing family planning and advancing sexual reproductive health was palpable. But to me, having been in the presence of the meeting of Ron Daniels, Mike Clagg, with, with Melinda Gates. Towards the end of this meeting, and I think Josh, Josh here else was there, Melinda asked a question to Ron, 
And Melinda said, Ron, so are you going to other parts of Ethiopia or other parts of Africa after this? And Ron said, no, I came for the conference. And Melinda said, why? And he said, because it is part of our global mission in public health and family planning is at the core of it. In another meeting of the same Ron Daniels, you know, and Mike Clark with the president of Packard Foundation, at the end of the meeting, Carol Larson, the president, of, said, can I ask you a personal question, Ron? And Ron said, yes, sure. And the same question was asked. Ron, did you come here just for the conference? And Ron said, yes. And said the same thing that she said to Melinda, that this is part of the mission of the university. It is public health and family planning is at the core of it. But if you ask many people, including me, and especially probably Bob and Anna, what the conference is all about was about the participation of the youth. It brought energy, creativity to the entire conference. This is the largest number of youth ever to have attended a family planning conference. At last count, and this is a more careful count, over 400 young people under age 25 were present at the conference. And many of us were probably skeptical when somebody, I don't know who the author Bob, it must be Anna, right? That we are going to have a contest among young people from all over the world to submit an application to be able to speak at the conference and be part of the conference via, via YouTube. And some people said, like, would that really work? Well, it turned out it was one of the most brilliant ideas. More, I think, 140 young people from all over the world submitted and uploaded their videos you know, on YouTube. And if you want to see a good something of it, the top 20 is actually on the International Family Planning website. They are incredible. Amy Choi decided to support all 20 of them to come to the conference. And ultimately, other donors chipped in and 40 of them were able to come to the conference. This is over and above another conference that was sponsored by the African Union on Youth and the International Planned Parenthood Federation also on Youth, all happening at around the same time. Time is up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if, if you want any questions at all, you have one minute if you want no questions. Yeah, let me just end then with this, that it's more than a conference. It is really a movement from our point of view. And these conferences are just strategic inflection points for the community to come together to see what the challenges are, to celebrate and network as part of a much larger movement. Thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to do what I shouldn't do, so wait one minute for one question. Any questions? What's next? Two years? Yeah. What's, next? What's next? So we're thinking about 2015, tomorrow, at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, we have a reflections uh, convening meeting in Washington, D.C., in which we're going to bring people who have been to the conference and ask them to reflect about the conference and ask suggestions, what's next? <laughs> as far as I know what's next, 2015, uh, Indonesia has been in, is interested in hosting the next conference and is willing to put up some monies, both private and government money, in order to co-sponsor the conference. That means that we'll have to bring the conference out of Africa, three, three, uh, three conferences in a row, to Asia. Will we lose momentum if we do that in Africa? Or would we truly make this an international family planning conference by doing it outside Africa? So it's not a done deal. 
that's going to be held, you know, in 2015 in, in Asia, particularly Indonesia, that is still uh, up in the air. Uh, we need to find out whether it's going to happen or not uh, through negotiations in the next uh, few months. But if I were the only one making a decision, uh, I would propose that the next conference in 2015, this is going to be in November, by September in 2015, the UN General Assembly would have decided on the post-MDG agenda. If family planning and reproductive health is part, as I think it should be, of the post-MDG agenda, then the theme of the conference would revolve around that. If the theme of the conference would revolve around that, to me personally again, then it would be, the entire theme would be about inspiration around this new challenge of the post-MDG. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just do have to make one comment, which is that for many years there were conferences uh, that touched on family planning. It was with the, this series that the conferences actually were on family planning, that they did not argue whether family planning had a place or not in population, in environment, uh, in women's development. They postulated that family planning was the question before us, and that made a huge difference. Uh, next speaker is going to be Scott Radloff, who is a senior scientist in our department. Uh, he uh, joined the Gates Institute after he served for 30 years with USAID, uh, and in the last seven years he was director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health uh, in the Bureau for Global Health, and he saw, oversaw and centrally managed the field programs in more than 40 countries and a budget that exceeded 600 million annually. Uh, we don't have that in the department, I should tell you. We're, we're working on it. Uh, before joining USAID, he was a fellow at the Economic Growth Center at Yale and at the RAND Corporation. He has a PhD from Brown in sociology, uh, specializing in demography and demography, not democracy, demography, <laughs> uh, and attended the University of Vermont as an undergraduate. He is now director of PMA 2020, and he is going to tell us uh, what that means. It is a program that sponsors annual mobile assisted household and facility surveys in 10 different countries and in support of uh, performance monitoring uh, and accountability of the agenda of Family Planning 2020. Scott? Thank you, Lori. Um, maybe just to start with, um, to say that the uh, PMA 2020 came about through the confluence of two streams. One is uh, uh, coming out of the London Summit and the FP 2020 initiative was an interest among the key donors in marking progress in family planning more frequently than every five years, which is what we do at the DHS. Um, and a second stream is the uh, evolution of the smartphone to a point where it can be used for conducting uh, surveys. Um, so it's the evolution of the smartphone and also the penetration of uh, mobile phone access in uh, most of the countries we work in. So um, yeah, as Lori said, we're um, sponsoring these mobile uh, assisted phone uh, surveys in uh, 10 countries. Uh, we have five in year one, uh, Ethiopia, DR Congo, Ghana, Kenya, and Uganda. Uh, and then in year two, Burkina Faso, India, with a focus on Uttar Pradesh. Indonesia, Nigeria, and uh, it's a little bit up in the air, Cote d'Ivoire or Senegal, it's Cote d'Ivoire at the moment. Um, the main goal is to monitor progress in access and use of contraceptives and to track the 120 million new contraceptive users to be served under FP 2020. Um, another goal is to build sustainable country capacity for continuous monitoring using this mobile um, tool. Um, 
and to uh, support rapid data collection for annual estimates and for dissemination. Um, and this is uh, what we call the MAD survey or mobile ad survey. It's the mobile assisted data and dissemination system. Um, it supports two linked mobile assisted sentinel surveys. Uh, one is a household and female survey, which measures demand and use, and a service delivery point, STP survey, measuring supply and access. Um, the features of uh, the MAD survey, of course, it's the uh, innovative mobile technology is uh, uh, important. Uh, it supports low cost, rapid turnaround surveys, generating annual, uh, at least initially semi-annual uh, indicators of progress. Uh, once the platform is established, it's expandable to other health sectors. Uh, it provides consistency with uh, DHS measures. Probably 90% of the questions we ask are replicas of the DHS. Uh, but it also introduces a new, uh, new set of indicators on quality, choice, and access. Um, it also has a uh, community feedback loop uh, to prompt uh, program improvement. Um, and then last but not least, uh, it will strengthen local capacity. We're working through a network of partners, of uh, university and research institution partners. Most of them are partners that we've uh, established through um, the Gates Institute partnership over the past 10 years. Um, and then last but not uh, least is the network of resident enumerators. So these uh, cell phones that we're going to be utilizing um, will be um, used by um, enumerators, females recruited from the enumeration areas that reflect a represent, represent, representativeness of the country. So that's an innovative feature along with the cell phone is this uh, idea that you can train resident enumerators who can be redeployed every uh, six months for new rounds of the survey. So this is just a depiction of how this is working. And maybe taking as an example, uh, Ghana, which is our first launch country. So we have uh, here our um, resident sentinel enumerator equipped with a smartphone with um, a software package called ODK, Open Data Kit, on it. And she will be um, conducting interviews of about 40 households in the enumeration area that she's assigned to or that she's from. Um, in addition, in, in, in each of those households, she will um, conduct a household roster and then um, interview all um, women age 15 to 49 in the household, uh, just as the DHS does. Um, in addition, she will be um, uh, conducting interviews of uh, randomly selected service delivery points from the enumeration area. So once she um, completes the survey, she takes a GPS reading as the last step and then submits it to a uh, central um, cloud-based uh, server for aggregation um, and analysis. So there's, uh, as the data are coming in, there's um, simultaneous uh, validation and at least initial analysis of the data that can be conducted. And once completed, um, can be fed back to community, uh, district, regional, and national levels and to international audiences. So uh, I won't go through this in much detail, but just to give you a sense of what these um, screens look like in Open Data Kit. And uh, there are a variety of different um, types of um, uh, data entry. Uh, there's a uh, radio buttons here that um, on education level, so you can only press one and um, you can't press more than one. Um, it's also set up in a way that you can't advance to the next question unless you've answered the current question. The second screen here shows you that uh, this is what age were you when you first started using a method of contraception, and a number pad comes up for that. Another type of question asks you uh, what household items uh, do you have? And this one allows you to indicate more than one. You can see the scroll bar. This goes on for another two pages or so. Um, and then finally, this is an SDP question on what methods of contraception are provided, uh, counsel provided, uh, referred or count, uh, and charged for. And again, this uh, allows you to uh, indicate more than one uh, types of service uh, for each method. And again, you see the scroll bar. This goes on for another few more pages to cover about 14 methods of contraception. Um, 
using mobile devices lends itself to new types of data collection. I mentioned GPS, so at each household and each facility, we're taking a GPS reading that allows us to go back for, oh, three minutes, but I better hurry up here. We have GPS, we have uh, date and time stamps, so we know when interviews started and completed, and we can compute average times, so we can look at enumerators to see who's doing it more slowly than we would expect and who's doing it more quickly. Uh, it has photo capabilities. We're taking photos of every household and uh, every, uh, the entrance way to every household and every facility to come back to. And then payment for enumerators. So in Kenya, many of you know about M-Pesa. So we're gonna be able to use M-Pesa as a way so the enumerators can be paid once they complete their quota of surveys uh, through their phone. Uh, here's a status report on our five year one countries. Uh, in Ghana, we're working through the uh, Tech University in Kumasi, KNUST, and um, University Development Studies in T Tamale. 100 enumeration areas. We're just completing now um, the data. Actually, the data collection is, is nearly complete, and we're um, um, conducting the uh, analysis of the data. Uh, DR Congo, it, data collection is underway. Um, that's being implemented by Tulane University with the University of Kinshasa. Ethiopia, we're midway through the training now. Um, you can see there we have 200 enumeration areas, so that's the largest survey we're sponsoring uh, this year. Uh, Uganda, we're working through Makerere University. Um, we're hoping uh, to have training begin in January and then closely thereafter, uh, Kenya. We're working with the um, International Center for Repro Reproductive Health. Uh, this is just a few pictures of our Ghana launch. You can see the enumerators from Tamale up in the north of Ghana. Uh, who we trained and in Accra, and just a few pictures of the training and the preliminary data aggregation there as well. Uh, this shows you the speed of data collection. So we, um, over the course of, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, about six weeks, we hope to complete these within a four to six week period. In Ghana, we were 90% complete in six weeks, which is quite impressive being the first time to do this. And they also, st we staggered the training in a way that they didn't all get off to the st same start. Few top line observations. Uh, REs, the resident enumerators are the backbone of PMA. We need to recruit, train, support, reward, and retain them. That's key, is we want to be able to, to uh, have re, uh, good retention. Um, we've, uh, we have a slogan called No Phones, uh, No Program. We need to have the fo right phones in the right place at the right time. It's a slogan we borrowed from uh, logistics, contraceptive logistics through J JSI. Um, also, we've learned that uh, governments are interested not just in national estimates, but in subnational detail. Uh, and they're also interested in added modules. Um, but we're clear that we need to uh, focus first on the family planning module and uh, get that right before we start expanding. Um, quickly going through what we've learned from Ghana, we've learned that, that these resident enumerators can be trained to conduct these surveys um, with adequate uh, supervisory support. The survey rounds can be completed in four to six weeks. Cascade training is highly effective. We train the supervisors and then they do the training of all the resident enumerators. Let me skip down to some surprises. Uh, there's more front end uh, training and um, um, maybe uh, supervision than we initially estimated. Um, also one uh, surprise is that, um, that there are very few uh, smartphones that meet our requirements. M many of them fail on not being able to give good GPS readings. And we've yet to learn whether this enumerated network is resilient. We'll see that over time. And uh, the feasibility of using this network for community feedback. Again, that hasn't happened uh, quite yet in Ghana. And this just gives you a, uh, uh, a sample uh, look at our uh, report template. We have a two-page report we plan to uh, issue in every country on key family planning indicators. Uh, this is kind of the tip of the iceberg, but sort of the key indicators for FP 2020, which includes um, contraceptive use, but also indicators of uh, access, equity, quality, and choice. And for all of these, we have, uh, of course, uh, much more detailed uh, data tables that will flow from uh, this data, uh, from this data collection. So I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'll cheat one question. Any questions? Or has is it all clear? Very clear. Been so there. You all ha will have chance during the reception to meet with the speakers and answer any other questions. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs> the idea that we're really assessing 
what gets done uh, is a new addition and a very important one. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Michelle Decker, who was trained as a social epidemiologist and uh, as an assistant professor in our department, she brings over a decade of uh, practical and research experience in gender-based violence and other kinds of gender inequities uh, and their implications, of course, for sexual and reproductive health. She has a degree from the University of Rochester in Community Health and Women's Studies, a Master's of Public Health from the University of Carolina, and a, uh, an SCD from the Harvard School of Public Health in social epidemiology. You can see we're pretty broad-minded about people that have their uh, health degrees from other schools. Uh, it is permissible. Uh, and um, uh, in, in any case, uh, she was also, while she was at Harvard, uh, associate director of a violence against women prevention practice as well as being an instructor and a research associate. Uh, her observational and intervention research includes both general populations uh, and women who are especially vulnerable because of the kind of work uh, that they do uh, and their residence in settings of protracted poverty. Uh, and she will be talking to us about all of this today. Thank you, Michelle. Great, thank you. Well, it's a, a real pleasure to be here today, um, and, and, and indeed, thanks for um, your open-mindedness in, in, uh, in having me here. Let me see if I can move us forward. Wonderful. Well, <clears throat> in contrast to, I think, some of our other panelists, um, what I'm going to talk with you about today is not so much one particular study or initiative, but rather to really give you an overview of some of the um, some of the very recent um, and ongoing work um, in my area in gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health, um, just sort of taking a survey approach to all of this. Um, and I just want to start out by um, raising your uh, attention around so, sort of the global ver burden of gender-based violence. People are probably familiar with the latest WHO estimates that came out um, just in the past couple of months. Around one in three women worldwide experience physical or sexual violence in their lifetimes. This is largely at the hands of current and former partners. Um, and very recently, a tremendous review came out around homicide, um, reporting that globally about a third of homicides of women are perpetrated by intimate partners, likely to be an underestimate because of some of the reporting issues, um, but really affirming the role of gender-based violence and morbidity and mortality for women's, uh, women and women's health worldwide. Um, People may have also seen, um, there was a large study that was released by the UN uh, in, the, in the early fall um, around rape perpetration and partner violence perpetration. Um, really interesting sort of to get the um, perpetrator perspective on all of this. We often focus on the victims for their needs, psychosocial and medical needs. Um, much of my research focuses on the victims as well. Um, and it was really interesting to see sort of the reaction to this. I was not involved in this study, but I did a lot of media around this, um, in part because the rates of perpetration were so high. They were staggeringly high. Um, and, you know, I was all prepared to sort of speak with people about um, some of the causes and some of the consequences, et cetera. And I was very surprised to hear that people were really, really, really sort of shocked by these numbers. And I sort of said, well, yes, they're, they're, they're horrifying. We don't like to think that this is happening in our communities. We don't want to think that you know, women are being um, victimized in this way. And yet when we look um, to the past 20 years of evidence um, that's been collected among women when we see robustly over time that the burden is so high, it actually is no surprise when we have our epidemiology hats on that the perpetration burden could be so great. Um, just not to um, tremendously dwell on that, but really just to give you a sense of, um, a sense of the global picture and, um, and, the, and a pulse, let's say, on all of this. Um, some of our recent work with the demographic and health surveys um, has worked to really document the burden of partner violence among adolescent and young adult women in low and middle income countries. Oftentimes the discussions around partner violence and sexual violence are sort of focused on adult women sort of in a very broad sense. Um, and what we see um, typically in studies, um, isolated studies, clinic-based studies, is that the burden truly to adolescents and young adults is actually quite tremendous. So we set out to really summarize this data, harnessing the most recent DHS data um, in uh, the available nations on this. And what you can see, um, I don't know how well these are going to 
sort of show up, but both for adolescents 15 to 19 and young adults 20 to 24, the burden was quite high. Um, across all nations that we were able to include here, um, it was just under 30%. So when we're thinking about high-risk groups for gender-based violence victimization, Adolescents and young adults feature prominently, and any response to adolescent sexual reproductive health really must include this dimension um, for a variety of reasons, not least the burden. <clears throat> so why is this so relevant to sexual and reproductive health domestically and globally? Well, we see over time um, across many studies, and actually now, fantastically enough, uh, meta-analyses as well, that partner violence is consistently associated with contraceptive non-use, unintended pregnancy, and STI HIV, including some very recent and very compelling prospective data around STI and HIV and partner violence from Uganda um, and South Africa as well. Why do we see these patterns? Qualitatively, we see women's limited ability to refuse sex in the face of violence and coercion, limited control over condom negotiation, and coerced and forced sex are, are quite often unprotected. The perpetrators of partner violence really do undermine this women's, um, this reproductive freedom for women and their sexual health too, through birth control, sabotage, pregnancy-related pressure, abortion-related pressure and coercion, as well as coercive sexual risk. We've seen this qualitatively as well, and I'll show you some data um, that, that um, are fairly new. But first, I think a quote really illustrates this. Um, this is from some of our earlier work in Boston around, uh, around really trying to tease out these patterns. Why do we see that violence undermines sexual health? She's, this young woman says, well, he start, we, we started using condoms, then we would fight over it, then he stopped using condoms completely. She felt that he uh, got her pregnant on purpose and then coerced her into an abortion. This woman also got an STD from this abusive partner, um, and I think this really captures, um, captures those dynamics. <clears throat> Um, some of the quantitative data on this, um, one of the things that has been really exciting over the past couple of years for me has been quantifying some of the pieces that we hear qualitatively from women domestically and internationally. We often would see things about fear of condom um, requests, fear of refusing sex. We often see these sort of in the discussion section and they're in qualitative papers. Well, we're starting to collect some quantitative data on this. Um, and what we see are um, high levels, certainly of condom non-use um, against her will. Um, and these, all of these rates are much greater for those that are actively experiencing partner violence. So this is telling us a little bit about how these coercive dynamics are undermining sexual and reproductive health for women. Um, oh, and I want to draw your attention as well to um, that last piece around unprotected anal intercourse. We're increasingly learning about the HIV um, transmission risks for this form of sex. And so when we see these patterns around partner violence and unprotected anal intercourse, it's really raising our attention that we need to be addressing this for women in clinical settings as well as partner violence support um, communities. Um, what are we doing about this? Um, I'm really pleased to share um, that uh, I've been involved in a, um, an intervention that's really leveraging the health system as an agent of change. Um, a clinic-based intervention in, in family planning clinics um, doing provider skill building, sort of building on sort of a traditional partner violence screening protocol by enhancing provider skills, uh, providing harm reduction messages, uh, both for violence reduction as well as mitigating the health impact. We do a lot of um, LARC promotion, long-acting reversible contraception promotion in the context of this as well. Um, and then we give safety cards as a way to affirm harm reduction messages. Um, so the pilot RCT um, findings are very promising and we have a larger RCT underway now. Um, and this of course is in partnership with Futures Without Violence. Um, I'm going to have to talk even faster in three minutes. Um, very excitingly, um, yet another Project Connect, this is funded through the um, Office on Women's Health, um, is scaling up this intervention model in 11 sites, one of which is uh, Maryland. So we're incredibly pleased to be working uh, closely with Planned Parenthood Maryland, um, House of Ruth, um, as well as the Maryland Health Department um, on implementing this. And we're, of course, leading the client impact evaluation. So we'll be rolling this out um, just after the first of the year. And I want to tell you very briefly um, a little bit about some of my work with women involved in sex work, an incredibly vulnerable population. We tend to think of these women solely from an HIV perspective. Increasingly, what we're documenting is very, very, very high levels of partner violence and client violence to this population. Um, some of our work in Moscow, as well as other areas of Russia, have demonstrated um, truly the first associations of violence against sex workers and its links with STI and HIV. 
Um, and we're also finding significant unmet contraceptive needs and repeat abortions to this population. Not surprising when you think about the stigma and the marginalized nature of this group, but very, very, very important when we're thinking about ensuring equality and rights to health and freedom and freedom from violence. Um, and this is just a depiction of the disparity in STI and HIV based on client violence experiences um, from our Moscow data. Really interested in um, modeling the impact. What if we were to reduce um, and even eliminate gender-based violence against sex workers? What would the HIV impact be? Um, I did this in uh, collaboration with some colleagues as part of a World Bank um, synthesis. Very interesting. We did a bunch of modeling for this, and I was responsible for the violence piece. And what you can see is that um, at the status quo, um, a number of uh, infections are uh, reducing, in part because of ART scale-up. Um, and you see significant gains in terms of new infections to sex workers um, over a five-year period in both Ukraine, which is a, more of a concentrated epidemic setting, as well as Kenya, a more generalized epidemic setting. This is very interesting. My colleagues were um, uh, very invested in this, and we're certain that once we uh, adjusted for the um, antiretroviral that, that we weren't really going to see any gains. Um, and, and here, in fact, we actually were able to, to some, post some of those gains. Um, in terms of reducing gender-based violence against sex workers. So I think this really creates, um, creates a momentum for really investing in this, particularly on the heels of um, um, World AIDS Day. Um, we've been also very interested in what's the intersection of this key population, sex workers? Can we find them in places like STD clinics? Do, we, do they show up in family planning clinics, for example? We tend to think of this as sort of a separate population. Um, some of our recent work from California and increasingly in Baltimore as well is demonstrating that, that yes, indeed, we do see women involved in sex work showing up in our family planning clinics, whether or not they disclose. Um, we see greater levels un of unintended pregnancy to this population. Um, no significant differences in abortion, um, but we also see real disparities in terms of recent sexual violence to this population. Not a surprise, but when we think about the global evidence on sex workers, it's l very little of it is comparative. So demonstrating some of these differences in a clinical setting or elsewhere is really advancing the epidemiology for this incredibly marginalized group. Um, I've got a, um, in response to this sort of synergy of evidence demonstrating the health issues and the violence victimization for sex workers, um, I was very thankful uh, just, just over the past six months to receive a faculty development award from the Center for AIDS Research here at Johns Hopkins. Um, we're developing a gender-based violence intervention module um, for women in sex work right here in Baltimore. We have a coalition approach that really synergizes um, sex worker outreach organizations, anti-trafficking programs, and the traditional violence support community, so House of Ruth, Turnaround, organizations that provide crisis services to women around um, violence issues on a large scale and over many years that have really rarely specifically looked at um, this high-risk population. And um, in terms of operationally, what we're doing here is we're leveraging those outreach workers, sort of the cornerstone of HIV prevention and education for sex workers. We're leveraging um, that, that uh, infrastructure as an agent of change in um, delivering messages and safety um, harm reduction for women around uh, violence, violence victimization. So uh, just to wrap up, um, my work is really motivated, as you can see, um, because in the sense that uh, gender-based violence really does remain a significant threat um, to women's health globally, concentrated among our, our most vulnerable populations. Um, and what we see in the context of these power imbalances is limited um, um, leverage and agency to negotiate sexual and reproductive health in the context of economic dependence and sex work, in the context of violence and coercion um, for partner violence. And I'm incredibly thankful to um, both uh, students and trainees here, as well as colleagues um, here at the school and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, once uh, again, we've used up our question time. Uh, I guess I would ask the question, how in the world can you claim that there are unintended pregnancies when we all know that the body shuts down at a time of right? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Um, Thank you. In, in any case, uh, is there any question? This is too important. Yes, Stan. On the plane back from Africa, I picked up the and they're debating in France about um, 
making prostitution slash sex yes. work illegal. Yes. Uh, would that make things better or worse from your perspective of what you presented? Good question. Um, we yes, have pass. many, we have a range of legalization and criminalization. You tend to see a little bit more safety in legal context of decriminalization and regulation. However, the burden of violence is still tremendous in places like New Zealand, in places where in certain jurisdictions it has been uh, legalized or regulated. So um, there's a, a big push globally from sex work organizations to decriminalize, to legalize. Um, I think that will get us a little way. I think it is being a little bit oversold in terms of the safety benefits to women. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on now, and I need to tell you that Amy Choi uh, suggested that I introduce her saying that she, quote, succeeded me as director of the Gates Institute and shortly will be joining me as past director and will resume being a full-time faculty member. Now, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you all remember the old New Yorker Department of Understatement, uh, that's, that's what this qualifies for. Um, Amy is a, a graduate of the University of Chicago. She held leadership positions at the University of North Carolina before coming here to head the institute, and uh, her contributions to the institute have been beyond measure. Uh, she's responsible for its wonderful reputation, uh, and uh, besides so much else, uh, that is supported by this tradition now of these international uh, family planning conferences which you've been hearing about. Uh, she conceived the idea, uh, and you just heard the third one described and the fourth one already uh, in its infancy. Uh, a, a, there's also, and I should mention this, one of you alluded to the partners that you would be working with. You did, Scott, I believe, alluded to the partners that would be working with you in the collection of data. That whole coterie of Gates partners uh, in academia in countless countries can attest to Amy's leadership uh, and their close connections that she's made with them and with their universities as she's encouraged and supported them. Uh, now, among other innovations, the Institute launched a six-country family health and wealth study, uh, and I will not tell you any more because Amy will tell you all about it. She'll be hearing, uh, share, this is a longitudinal study about which she'll be sharing the highlights. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to assume it's up here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Oh, I see, these are all sequential. Excellent. So thank you very much, Lori. Um, when I first came here, um, Lori led us always in this rousing statement of we are the Gates Institute. And you will see that the Gates Institute is everything that many people do here. So I don't claim credit um, except for the fact that I didn't have to organize the last conference and fortunately have a deputy director who, does, who did it. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the Family Health and Wealth Study. It is a study that has a cast of many characters, like most of the things that we do. Um, and it did, uh, does build on the foundation uh, of our partner institutions. So we have the University of Malawi, Makere University in Uganda, Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, Asyut University in Egypt. We have uh, Kwame Nkrumah University in Ghana, University of Abadan in Nigeria, and Obafemi Awolowo University in um, Nigeria also. And in addition, there are three, you know, uh, three uh, partners, one in, uh, sorry, two, one in China and one in India. So in China, it's the Nanjing College of Population Program Management. But the, what you're going to see here is primarily from the Africa sites. So this is an infographic that was uh, developed for the Family Planning Conference. And it says, family planning drives global development. And in fact, that's sort of the raison d'etre for the uh, Family Health and Wealth Study. And the Family Health and Wealth Study not only was an opportunity for partners to learn, um, learn, how to learn the importance of doing longitudinal data analysis, not relying only on cross-sectional data as many of us do, including myself, 
but the importance of being able to show the causal relationship um, with temporal data. So this infographic really drives it all. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and tell you what uh, the study has to say about this. So this, um, there were almost 5,000 households with married couples, and they occurred in these um, six peri in these uh, six countries in peri-urban sites just outside the main city. Um, one of the first studies that uh, showed was, was led by Julia Dreesen. She graduated from economics here at uh, Johns Hopkins, is now at the University of Pittsburgh's um, Health Policy, School of Public Health. And so she, along with Ching Feng Li and myself and others, um, found out that we could we could take what we normally use as a wealth asset index and deconstruct it into permanent wealth as well as transitory wealth. And the importance of the transitory wealth piece was that it was going to measure middle class consumption patterns. And the reason for the study was really to show that if the timing and number of childbearing changes, that we would see associated change with measures of wealth outcomes as well as health outcomes for women and children. So this paper is um, now under review, and uh, we were able to identify a middle class consumption index, which we call the transitory wealth index. And we looked at the patterns related to um, presence of young children, and we found that young children zero to five didn't really make much difference on, this, um, on the household income measures, but the presence of older children who would be school going and who would require school fees did. So, we found that these households were less satisfied with their level of income and were less likely to say that next year that their income would be better as a result of having um, children 5 to 14. And these are all adjusted. Another paper that was recently presented in Otis was done by Linnea Zimmerman and all of our other colleagues. And she's a doctoral student here. And she was looking at the relationship between family size and educational attainment. And she found that, not surprisingly, the larger the family, the less educational attainment. But she also found that girls were less likely than boys to fall behind in their schooling. So once girls reached, got through primary schooling years, they tended to go on. If they got through that, they tended to go on, whereas boys tended to drop out. And she also found that mother's education was highly associated with, the, with stronger educational attainment amongst their children. Um, Fumi Ola Oloran, who finished a doctorate, her doctorate here and has returned uh, to be her to her faculty position at the University of Abaddon, worked on this study called Women's Fertility Preferences. Do they influence contraceptive behavior? So if you want to have more children or if you don't want to have more children, are you more likely to use contraception? And that's kind of a duh question, you know, <laughs> like why would you use it if you didn't? But um, there's not a lot of data out there that exactly says that. So since we had the longitudinal data, she could look at the intentions early on. And sure enough, women tend to behave rationally, um, adjusting for everything. Good thing. Um, and then the, uh, Michelle Hinden, who is one of the faculty colleagues on this, found um, a, four scales that assess relationship quality between partners. and. This became like everybody's interest, uh, in, uh, everybody became very interested in using this. So there have been three dissertations done here, not counting the ones that we're, we know of elsewhere, um, looking at marital relationship quality. And uh, two of them are listed here. The third one is by Stephanie Tasaki, who looked at relationship quality and postpartum or, and depression. So in, um, in these two study, in three studies here, uh, Carrie Montefering's and Nitu John's, we're, they, these are both dissertations, and Carrie's is about to be published in International Perspectives, and Adele Takuri, who's a uh, postdoc, um, looked to see whether relationship quality made any difference for contraceptive use, and um, it does. And secondly, it also, uh, also with this type of study, by looking at the couples and their concordance and their um, relative reports, could find that you, it's, it's good to study um, relationships like this in dyads. That is, looking only at the woman's report or only at the man's report is, is an incomplete picture. Um, and there's, a, there's interaction as well as you, as 
as you might expect with decisions about fertility and contraception. So working with diets is important. Also, um, uh, uh, I think Nitu's dissertation found that the uh, higher wife score influenced the use of coital dependent methods. So it's particularly a component like trust. If the woman expressed more trust in their relationship, she, they were more likely to use a condom or withdrawal or rhythm. That shouldn't be a surprise, but again, this was documented in the study. The husband, in turn, if he had a, if he reported a better score about the relationship, the, the length of contraceptive use was longer. And then um, Adele Takuri, working with Stan Becker, found that partners don't always report the same methods, and we tend to think women um, are more discreet in reporting their use of methods that are not visible, but it turns out that husbands also report methods that the wives don't report, and so somebody is not telling the truth. Um, so, we, so we shouldn't always assume the wife is giving us the right numbers. So we have other studies going on, and we're hoping that, um, that, the, that these studies can eventually be compiled in a collection uh, for a journal supplement. And, uh, and I just wanted to end by saying that um, the Malawi president, uh, Joyce Banda, who almost made it to the Addis Conference, actually endorsed these billboards. And this one billboard encapsulates the theme of the family health and wealth study. So thank you very much. Now I, uh, we have the pleasure of being able to entertain some questions. Yeah, I'm just going to give my time to Oying. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Anybody got any comments or questions? None. Uh, do you uh, can you can you just tell us very very briefly where this is going next? This study. It's a longitudinal study. We know. Um, we're hoping to do one one more round, a third round, in two countries, Ghana and Ethiopia, because their attrition and the sample sizes small enough to allow enough power for a third round. But we're also, the other place where there is um, sufficient sample size is in the China study. And there has been publications in Chinese journals um, about fertility preferences. And we're sort of hoping, given that there's been a liberalization of the one-child policy there, that we can continue to track the preferences there and see if it makes a difference. Thank you. That should be very interesting to see what uh, any differences with the policy change. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is Beth Frederick uh, with uh, Duff Gillespie, who is also here with us today. Uh, Beth is leading the Advanced Family Planning Initiative of the uh, Gates Institute, uh, and uh, she is also a senior associate in our department. Uh, Beth has held leadership positions in the Center for Communication Programs, uh, in International Women's Health Coalition, and at the Guttmacher Institute, where I first knew her many years ago. Um, and uh, she uh, was a Bell Fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health, was adjunct faculty with the New York University Graduate School of Public Service, and holds a BA from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, she also now chairs the uh, board of the IBIS uh, Reproductive Health uh, Organization and serves as treasurer on the board of Empower, a grant-making organization supporting youth and health and development in emerging markets. Um, she is going to tell us now about advanced family planning, uh, which uh, is an advocacy effort that is designed to increase support both in terms of financial resources and policy uh, developments and policy environment for family planning in nine developing countries and globally. Would, would you join us, Beth? Thank you, Lori. And um, thanks to everybody for the opportunity to share a few highlights and lessons learned from advanced family planning. And it's, as Lori said, it's an initiative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Institute within the department and the School of Public Health. With Duff Gillespie, I've had the privilege of leading this highly focused advocacy effort over the past four years. 
and I'm going to be indebted to Duff forever for calling me up one summer day and asking me to join him on this project because it's the job of a lifetime and it's really a project that makes a difference in people's lives. With colleagues here in Baltimore and partners in Africa, Indonesia, and India, we've been able to convince those in power that family planning is a wise investment, supports women's health and well-being, and is fundamental to human rights. Our approach to advocacy has resulted in nearly 60 policy changes, or what we call quick wins. All 60 plus promise to improve access to contraceptive information, services, and supplies. And today, I will share three examples to provide a flavor for just how advanced family planning does that. Does this work? Nope. Now we're back. Okay, these quick wins have resulted in budget increases for family planning at the national, state, and district level. They've overcome policy barriers. Wait, looks like I'm on the wrong page. Sorry about that. Okay, so first let me start with an overview of the AFP approach. We begin by relying on the deep knowledge and local partners of local partners and policymakers. They tell us what's needed and what's possible, and they set priorities for action. Sometimes we disagree with them, but mostly they're always right. This local ownership is the key secret to making change happen and seeing policy take hold. We then focus on proven interventions. This is where the evidence comes in. We support advocacy with the best possible evidence of where policy change might make the greatest difference. This evidence comes from our colleagues here within the Bloomberg School of Public Health, as well as expertise within the countries themselves. We take time to identify the key individuals who can make change happen and tailor a strategy around their interests. Too often we think that we must aim to influence the highest person at the highest level of government, when in fact it's a government official or a other interest group who will be critical to the success of an advocacy strategy. Finally, we bring together committed individuals around a smart advocacy objective. For those of you who've done anything in the um, field of management sciences or any sort of decision-making process, SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And we use that to set an objective for our advocacy. We focus on the potential for what we call quick wins, which are policy decisions that have support and evidence behind them and can be achieved in the near term, usually within six months to a year. So now I'll get to the uh, results and the impact. These quick wins have resulted in budget increases for family planning at the national, state, and district level. They've overcome policy barriers to help community health workers provide a wider range of contraceptive methods in hard-to-reach areas. They've streamlined systems for procurement and delivery of contraceptive services. While a core group of advocates are working most closely with advanced family planning, Many more have been trained in the advance, the AFP SMART approach and are replicating it more widely. We're building on momentum gained in the first phase of advanced family planning as well as the monumental London Summit on Family Planning in 2012. Over 500 champions, those who will take a stand to support family planning and are poised to take action, are actively involved in working with our partners. And because of the results achieved, advanced family planning is now supported to 2017 to work with partners in nine countries. Those nine countries are Indonesia, India, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, and three Francophone countries, Burkina Faso, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Senegal. So now I'm going to turn to the first example, a specific example of how we've, we, our advocacy has uh, delivered revo results. This one focuses on gaining greater resources for family planning in Uganda, where the need is great. And it's estimated that one in three women don't have access to modern contraception and want to um, prevent a pregnancy. On May 25, 2010, the World Bank approved a five-year, $130 million loan for improvement of health infrastructure, which, which set aside $30 million for maternal and reproductive health. In presenting the loan for parliamentary approval, the Network of African Women Ministers and Parliamentarians, which is represented by Sylvia Sinsenbulia, who's pictured there, went a step further to insist that 70% or $20.2 million of the maternal and reproductive health funds be allocated for family planning. AFP is now working with the network and NGOs to ensure that the government allocates funding for contraceptive commodities as directed. 
In Uganda's current budget, World Bank resources and this earmark are critical to helping them meet their commitment to the London summit. Now the challenge will be to see that those resources are used appropriately. A different type of quick win was achieved in Kenya by our partner, Japaigo. There, there was a lot of research to, that showed that community health workers could safely provide contraceptive injectables, but the government was unable to pass guidance to enable them to do so. The man pictured on the left, Dr. Isaac Bashir, was head of the Division of Reproductive Health in the Kenya Ministry of Health and he agreed to lead the development of a highly focused advocacy strategy in January 2012. In addition to fortifying support within the Ministry of Health, the advocacy approach identified the support of the Kenyan Nurses Association, which was critical to moving the guidance forward. Until that time, the nurses had been uh, staunchly opposed to the guidance going forward. We facilitated an effort by partners to map and effectively address their concerns and gain their support. We were fortunate in that the work coincided with the nurses' associations with international events such as the London Summit, endorse, endorsement of similar policies by the African College of Nursing, and the first ever guidance from the World Health Organization on task shifting for family planning and community health workers. As a result, the Kenyan government issued guidance to allow community health workers to provide contraceptive injectables on November 27, 2012. Advanced family planning is now working to see that the guidance is implemented in all 47 counties within Kenya. In contrast, oh, ah, there we go. In contrast to Uganda and Kenya, Indonesia has a historically strong family planning program. Contraceptive use is common, and six in 10 married women report using modern contraception. However, couples have typically not had access to long-term and permanent methods such as implants, the IUD, tubal ligation, and vasectomy. Like Kenya, it also has the challenge of decentralized decision-making, with over 500 district leaders having the potential to set health and policy and budget policy. In response, we've been increasing our work with district lead leaders over the past year, and our advocacy efforts are paying off. Mayors in five districts increase their budgets for family planning substantially, as you can see in the graph. They were prompted by evidence on the return for their investment, and the budget increases ranged from 20% in Bandung District to nearly 80% in Pontianak District from 2010 to 2013. In Bandung, all 270 village leaders who determine village budgets and report to the mayor also committed to allocating 2.5 million rupiah, and I won't tell you what that is in US dollars because it's a little embarrassing. Um, but they committed it specifically for community-based family planning activities. A byproduct was that a vil the vill village leaders learned more about their own family planning options. Many leaders came forward as champions for family planning, and in fact, one who led by example, he announced his own vasectomy to his community. <laughs> We're now replicating this approach even farther and faster across Indonesia and seeing what lessons can be shared with other countries. In conclusion, we've seen that an evidence-based, locally-driven advocacy effort can work. By focusing on decision makers and quick win policy change, we're continuing to push those in power to invest more and do better for women and couples in terms of family planning. Though there are many challenges and unknowns, we're already beginning to see the impact of these policy changes, and we look forward to reporting on our continued success. I want to apologize to Oying because the high-level ministerial meeting wasn't on my agenda for the presentation, but um, it was really a, a highlight of the International Conference on Family Planning for me, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the reception. Just a minute. Let's see about some questions. Are there any questions? Any further? a little bit about uh, the uh, high-level meeting? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the, <laughs> one of the uh, um, interesting parts about the conference overall and being one Gates Institute, as Amy was referencing before, is that we took in the theme of youth for the high-level ministerial mm -hmm. meeting and were able to co-convene um, co with the African Union, who was bringing in ministers of youth, to talk about what kinds of investments can benefit young people now and um, then eventually for social and economic development. We had 
31 countries um, represented, represented um, including Mongolia, which I don't, we didn't even invite Mongolia, but they showed up. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they, the report has yet to come out, but it was a very candid conversation about what countries can do to uh, address young people's needs for family planning and reproductive health services. Any, any other questions? I think it's really uh, important for us uh, sitting here in the United States to realize how amazing it is to many of us that in the 21st century, we're still arguing over some of the issues uh, that are being argued over uh, in ways that we could never have foreseen in the 1970s. We really thought the battles were won uh, with Roe v. Wade, with uh, Title X clinics, uh, with the Congress deciding that Title X uh, family planning clinics could see teenagers, uh, all kinds of things that were happening then that made us really think that the battles were, were won. And I think one of the important things that we don't emphasize enough about these international meetings and the international programs, such as the one that you just heard described, uh, is how much we learn not how much we teach, how much we can learn. Here we are in a country where the vast majority of women have used some contraception at some time, and yet half of our births are unintended. There is a lot we have to learn, and I'm particularly happy when I hear about these programs that are using in-country leadership uh, not just bringing out-of-country leadership in, but using in-country leadership. And my big hope is that some of what they learn will be brought home to this country. Uh, that would be a real blessing. Um, our uh, f final speaker is Caroline Moreau, uh, strongly dedicated to women's sexual and reproductive health. She's internationally recognized as a family planning researcher uh, she's focused on understanding contraceptive use patterns uh, and their association with not only unwanted pregnancy, uh, but recourse to abortion. Uh, now, uh, Caroline received her medical degree at the University of Pierre et Marie Curie in Paris uh, and a PhD in public health at Paris Sud uh, and uh, then uh, led a number of projects at institutions such as the National Institute of Health and Medical Research in France and a place that we call Princeton University uh, here in the United States. Uh, you may have heard more about it than you have about Paris Sud. Uh, but in, in any case, she uh, then joined the faculty here at Hopkins last year and has been co-investigator of the first national abortion patient survey in France and co-PI on a French uh, national survey, the 2010 to 2011 French national survey on sexual and reproductive health. Uh, working with colleagues here at the school as well as with many international colleagues that she continues to work with, uh, she has a strong emphasis on interdisciplinary research and cross-national comparative approaches. And we are going to understand some of the social determinants of sexual and reproductive behaviors as we listen to her today. Caroline. Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon. It's a great delight for me to end the series of presentations by talking about the Global Early Adolescent Study. Uh, which is a new initiative in this department uh, that is conducted in collaboration with WHO and five partners, uh, including two Gates partners we've talked about before. Um, so the overall goal of this study that is in many ways an extension of the work and activities that have been presented this afternoon 
is a focus on early adolescence in order to understand the factors that predispose these young, uh, these young people to subsequent sexual health risks, but also to con factors that contribute to healthy sexuality uh, in diverse cultural communities. And this uh, study aims to provide knowledge for parents and young people themselves in order to improve their sexual reproductive health trajectories over the life course. So why should we focus on early adolescents for, for whom in the most, or for the most part, have never engaged in sexual activity? Well, as many of you may remember or experience with your own children, it's a um, stage of human development that is associated with many transformations that are physical, psychological, and social. And uh, for instance, one of the hallmark of this period of the life course is puberty, which of course marks a transition towards adult appearances, but also comes with many new expectations uh, and um, gender expectations as young people embrace new gendered roles uh, that translates in diverging health trajectories that start emerging at that period of time. These differences in health trajectories between women and men will have lifelong consequences uh, for health. Now, of course, these differences are amplified in the context of sexual health for obvious biological reasons, but also for, for social reasons. As gender inequality, um, as Michelle has shown in her um, work, is a critical determinant of a host of sexual health outcomes. Sexual health causes a global challenge for the health of adolescents, and in fact is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality among young adolescent girls. Uh, in middle and uh, low income countries as they faced increased risk of coercive sexual intercourse as well as increased risk of H uh, uh, HIV and STIs. And of course they suffer gender specific consequences of pregnancy. Most of the efforts to address these challenges have focused on changes in the behaviors of adolescent girls, giving them the means to prevent some of the negative outcomes that are related to sexual behaviors. However, there has been little focus on upstream interventions that may alter these trajectories and determine more healthy sexual developments from early to later adolescence. One particular area of focus may be on analyzing and exploring how gender socialization in early adolescence informs other domains of healthy sexuality, which before young people become sexually involved, encompasses a broad range of dimensions from body pride to satisfaction with emerging sexuality, self-efficacy, and gender equitable relationships, all of which may have a clear and uh, long lasting impact on sexual, later sexual behaviors. So our study objectives are to describe the evolving process of healthy sexual development in, from early to later adolescence, to determine the role of parents, siblings, and peers in shaping healthy sexual development uh, in this uh, transitional period, and to look at specifically the contribution of gender socialization to healthy sexuality and later sexual behaviors in later adolescence. We will um, try to understand the commonalities and differences of these processes in very diverse cultural settings. The study is grounded in a conceptual framework that was developed by faculty in this department to understand sexual health in adolescents and the different levels of influences beyond individual and family influences. These 
also includes school and environmental factors as well as a broader cultural context that all contribute in shaping sexual development among these young people. We also embrace a um, life course perspective with the understanding that sexual behaviors and sexuality is a developmental process that starts before young people engage in sexual behaviors and has lifelong consequences and benefits for the health of adults. Um, the collaborative sites of this project include Egypt in Asut, Baltimore, Ili Ife in Nigeria, Nairobi in Kenya, New Delhi in India and Shanghai. And we specifically focus on urban poor populations. One, because they're the fastest growing population, but two, also because they face specific challenges linked to poverty uh, that uh, impair and uh, have a, a significant impact on poor sexual outcomes in this population. So the study is set to take place in two phases. Phase one will focus, one, on instrument development and on the understanding of the narratives of these young people as they transition from childhood to um, uh, later adolescence. Specifically, we aim to create and develop cross-culturally valid instruments to measure gender socialization and other domains of healthy sexuality establish the relationship between gender socialization and the other dimensions of healthy sexuality, and explore the commonalities and differences of these processes across culture. Phase two is an extension in phase one in that it, you will use instruments that are developed in phase one in a longitudinal design to describe gender socialization as an evolving process, explore parental and peer influences on this process, assess the predictive value of gender socialization on later sexual developments, and of course, understanding how context influences these processes. Uh, this is just a visualization of what we'll be doing, and I'll skip this um, to talk briefly about the specific activities of this study that has just started. Uh, phase one aims to create reliable, valid instruments that can be used by researchers globally to measure gender attitudes of masculinity and femininity in this early adolescent stage. We will also create vignette-based instruments to, as to assess gender biases in the context of relationship. And we will develop a, a survey of adolescent health, specifically focusing on the different dimensions of healthy sexuality. Finally, we will collect narratives of these young people and the stories they tell about how they transition from childhood to adolescent years. Phase two is a longitudinal study that will be carried out in six urban poor sites. We aim to include 1,400 young people who will be between the ages of 11 and 13 at enrollment, and they will be followed over time. We aim to collect three waves of data separated by 18 months apart. In conclusion, I would say there is tremendous um, enthusiasm in this department as well as among our partners to carry out this initiative. Uh, there is also a tremendous enthusiasm in the part of WHO, who has endorsed the study and uh, has uh, actually um, uh, decided this study was going to be one of their priority activities for the coming uh, year. Ad early adolescence is oh, a growing um, area of uh, interest that was actually highlighted in the last report by UNFPA, um, who highlighted the importance of conducting research among this uh, age group 
uh, in order to uh, actually develop opportunities to uh, engage and intervene before these young people face the sexual health challenges that a lot of our activities have evidenced. Thank you. Well, we actually have uh, a total of about five minutes uh, for questions, uh, first of all, for Caroline, and then if there are any other discussion or questions of materials that we've discussed so far this afternoon. Any questions for Caroline? I have a question. You are expecting to follow these same uh, young people that are interviewed in the phase one, uh, and how far into their adolescence or young adulthood do you wish to follow them? So this is actually phase two. Uh, we will include early adolescents, young adolescents, when they're between ages 11 and 13. Uh, and that's at the age of enrollment, and we aim to follow them for four years, uh, up to later adolescent years, with actually three times for data collection, uh, 18 months apart. Right through their older adolescence. Exactly, and the aim of the strategy is actually to um, validate our, our conceptual framework, which is to understand how healthy sexuality that develops before people engage in sexual behaviors is actually an antecedent of what comes later when they engage in sexual activity. Well, of course, you will find that some of them, by the time they are 14, uh, have already beat you to the draw, as it well <laughs> is, but uh, it's a, a fascinating study. Uh, any questions or discussion of anything you've heard from Oying on? I think that what we've, uh, we've gotten a little glimpse into that long list of topics that uh, Bob showed us at the beginning. Uh, Obviously, only a, a small proportion of those studies have been looked into this afternoon, but I hope that they'll give those of you that are not uh, a part of the department uh, a sense of the kind of work that is being done. Uh, any other questions you have can be raised, of course, during the reception, which we'll invite you to after uh, Bob returns to the podium. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, all of the presenters. I think one of the things that uh, was not really captured uh, that uh, I find as a department chair extraordinary is that every single one of these initiatives intricately and intimately involves students. Uh, um, uh, there isn't one that was discussed where students aren't actively participating, active in decision-making, active doing research, active doing training. Uh, and uh, it, so this is not just a slice of work that happens over here, and our educational mission happens over there but it is our educational mission and it is our service mission. I think it is, and these projects and studies reflect it well. What makes being in an institution like this and in a school of public health like this second to none? And that is that we don't live and dwell at 30,000 feet. I was having lunch with uh, a former student of mine who uh, is uh, getting her doctorate elsewhere, just, uh, um, that's the University of Elsewhere, um, just uh, um, last uh, Wednesday. And she was saying that she is getting an extraordinary grounding in theory, but misses the 
hands-on, on-the-ground applications. And I think that what the work that we do here, whether it is in Baltimore, through projects like Project Connect, through work with uh, commercial sex workers, and so many others, or whether it is work uh, that is occurring uh, in Russia, occurring in Vietnam, in Indonesia, et cetera, is practical on the ground experience. And the other observation I would make that to me, I love in this department, is that it is international, it is domestic, and it bridges uh, the two. It is a place where we export knowledge and we import knowledge. Uh, and uh, it enriches everything that we do. Uh, so uh, thank you all. And uh, uh, thank you all for coming. It does, from this vantage point, look like the bar is open. Uh, and uh, there is food. So, Laurie, thank you for facilitating this conversation.